My family lives sort of on the outskirts of Bradford. Of course, much like the town itself, our house was also surrounded by forest. If you took in the scene from our back porch, you would see nothing but sprawling trees for miles. I tell you this so you can gain a sense of isolation. Out at my house, you could scream at the top of your lungs, and no one would come to help you. This happened back in the summer of 1996. I was 11 years old at the time. I had a childhood friend named Marty, who was the same age. Our fathers worked together and knew each other well. He would come over almost every Friday to hang out. Marty and I found ourselves hiking through the trees as we often did. However, we were feeling a bit daring and went further into the forest than we usually did. There was this barrier of trees that we would never go past, simply because I didn't know the area beyond that point. We continued past the barrier into uncharted territory. We eventually came upon a clearing. In the middle of this clearing was an old, disheveled-looking tent. Being the curious young men we were, we of course had to see inside. As we approached, I could feel the temperature around me drop. I'm no stranger to the cold, but this was in the middle of summer. Even at my age, I could sense that there was something truly sinister inside this tent. A part of me was screaming to hightail it out of there, but my own curiosity pushed me forward. We both stopped just outside the tent, and suddenly, we were both too frightened to move any further. They were both frozen in place, staring at the open flap of the tent as it swayed from side to side. The sky seemed to grow even darker since we discovered this tent, and though we were standing directly in front of it, we could not see inside. What happened next is the reason that I still struggle with alcoholism. A dark hand slowly emerged from the tent's opening. It reached out to us, with long black nails protruding out from its fingertips. I'm not ashamed to admit that I pissed myself out of fear. The hand slowly turned and made a beckoning gesture with its index finger. And that's when Marty and I heard a deep, bellowing laughter from inside the tent. I don't remember much about what happened after that. I just remember me and Marty running for our lives, tearing through the woods and back to my house. I do have a vague memory of me briefly looking behind me as I ran to see a tall, dark, and human figure standing just outside the tent. Upon returning, Marty immediately called his mom to come pick him up. My mother asked us what was wrong, and we both explained to her that we saw some kind of creature in the forest. My mother ultimately dismissed our claims, but led us in a prayer while we waited for Marty's mom to arrive. Marty never came back after that, and we sort of drifted apart. Sadly, Marty began hanging out with the wrong crowd and began doing hardcore drugs when he was around 14. He ended up hanging himself in his bedroom when he was 17. As for myself, I suffered from severe night terrors that tormented me for years after that day in the woods. I'm not going to get into what I experienced in my nightmares but I will say that I became an alcoholic as a result. I'm a female, and this happened during spring break of 2011. At the time, I lived in New Jersey, and I would often drive out to the Pine Barrens on Saturdays and jog along a trail that a friend of mine showed me. I don't mean to be vague, but for the life of me, I can't remember the name of this trail, but I do remember that it was located in South Jersey, and from what I understand, there's lots of trails that run through that area. During this time, I was going through some health problems, and I was really focused on losing weight. During my jogs, I would often listen to my headphones. I had a playlist on my iPod that would help me get motivated. After parking my car, I set off on foot. I usually saw one or two other backpackers or joggers traversing the trail, but today, there was no one. About 30 minutes after I started, I got this feeling that I was being watched. I tried my best to brush it off as I continued down the path. This feeling became more and more prevalent. It felt like the forest itself was closing in on me. It got to the point where I stopped jogging and took out my headphones and listened carefully. I heard several frantic footsteps coming from behind the surrounding trees. 
At this point, I was becoming a bit unnerved, but I figured that it could be some kids just messing around. I called out, asking if anyone was there, but got no response. I should mention that on this particular trail, about a half a mile from its starting point, your cell phone was all but useless. After a minute or two of just standing there, I decided that it was time to cut this jog short. As soon as I turned around, I heard a rustling sound from behind me. I turned, and what I saw utterly horrified me. A masked man wearing a pair of boxers emerged from a bush that was alongside the trail. I know that may sound comical to some of you, but I assure you it was not. The mask this person was wearing is kind of hard to describe. It looked like an animal head of some kind, and just sort of hung off this guy's head, like it was several sizes too big for him. The most disturbing part of all was this half-naked maniac was covered in what looked like blood. It was like I was involuntarily thrusted into the plot of a horror movie. I took off running down the trail. As I did, I heard laughter and shouting coming from several directions behind me. I thankfully found my way back to the car in one piece. I drove out of there like a bat out of hell. I pulled over at the nearest gas station and immediately called the police. It took them almost an hour and a half to get out there, and he informed me that he would call in more cops and comb the area. He told me that someone from his department would eventually follow up with me. The next morning, I got a phone call from the police. They, of course, didn't find anyone matching the description I gave. However, they did find the skinned carcass of a deer not far from where I had encountered the man. I don't have confirmation on this, but thinking back to how strange that mask looked, I have to ask a question. Was that man wearing fresh deer skin? I'm a 20 year old male, and I run a large haunted house attraction. You pay to walk through, and we scare the lights out of you. We hold casting sessions about three weeks before the haunting season starts, and we always have interesting people show up. I develop a close connection with some of the actors throughout the season. A lot of haunters will tell you that this will develop a bond between people in some weird way. There was one kid that stood out to me during last year's audition. In fact, he impressed me so much that I allowed him to pick what scene he wanted to work. We never do that. We usually select the scenes that we want the actors to work. He ended up going with the butcher shop, and his performance was perfect. He scared the daylights out of the test group. We talked for about three hours after the test runs, and I'll never forget what he told me before leaving the makeup room. I'm just glad I found a job that allows me to act like I want to every day, minus the murder charges. We laughed about it, and I told him that I would be calling him soon. About four days later, I got his application out of the stack, and I was excited to call him and officially hire him. However, an old man answered the phone when I called. He went quiet when I asked him if the guy was home. After a short while, the old man asked me what I wanted with him. After I explained, the old man told me that the guy was no longer available, and naturally I was very disappointed, because I knew this guy would have been great for the haunted house. Fast forward to December, I was randomly browsing the internet, when I came across a news article on Yahoo's front page. It said, chilling 911 call finally released. There was a picture of someone who looked like the guy who had auditioned that year. After reading the article, I confirmed that it was the same guy. He had been arrested for shooting his mother and sister in the head. And I felt something that I had never felt before. I can't even explain it. Before clicking on the 911 call, I was expecting it to be a frantic neighbor, or maybe a family member. But no. It was him. He calmly spent 24 minutes explaining to the operator what he had done completely emotionless, saying things like, I guess I'm pretty evil, whatever. Listening to the call sent a chill up my spine, 
All I can say is you have to hear it for yourself. What if he had ended up working at my haunted house? Would he still have done it? Would he have killed somebody at the attraction? I think about this a lot more than I should, and I can't stand that. Okay, do you, um, is there any reason that you were so angry at your mother and your sister? Uh, I don't know, I, uh, I wasn't, it's weird, I wasn't even really angry with them. It just kind of happened. I've been kind of, uh, planning on, uh, killing for a while now. The, the two of them, or just anybody? When I was in elementary school, one of the boys a few grades ahead of me was Kyle Duby. I was two or three grades below him, so I didn't have much interaction with him outside of recess. He often made it a point to stand right behind me and yank on my pigtails as hard as he could, under the pretense that I was a horse and he was riding me. He also used to bring knives to school and would sometimes threaten some of his classmates with them when they did something to make him angry. And at one point, he actually pulled a knife on a young girl. It was after school behind one of the buildings. Why nothing was officially ever done about it, I couldn't tell you. But my school, being very small, was not known for being on top of the disciplinary side of things. There was just something about Kyle, the hair pulling, and just the general way he acted that ultimately made me feel uncomfortable whenever he was around. I wasn't alone in this regard. Former classmates have also expressed feeling uneasy in his presence. To my relief, he ended up moving away, and none of us heard anything about him for a number of years. Until one day, he showed up on the local news, having been arrested for the murder of Nicole Cable. He had made a fake Facebook profile, lured her out of her house, kidnapped her, and left her in the back of his dad's pickup truck. His intention was to pretend to find her so that he would be labeled a hero. When he found out that she was dead, he dumped her body in the woods and covered it with sticks and leaves. They found her about a week later. I was in school when I found out, and I had to go to the nurse's office because I felt so sick. It's very disconcerting to know that a murderer used to yank on my hair. As of writing this, he is going on trial in the next couple of days which is what prompted me to share this experience.